Okay, welcome. Um, I want to thank uh, Sebastian Schrietwieser for inviting me to come over here. Uh, my talk will be a little bit different. I'm an academic, so I'm going to present research results that are not mature enough yet to, uh, to go into production. So it's slightly different than the previous talks, uh, but I hope you enjoy it anyway. And so the topic of my talk is stealthy integration of software protections. This is joint work of, uh, well, it's actually the work of Jens, one of my PhD students. Uh, Bart advises him on a day-to-day -day basis, and I just sell his stuff in talks, right? Um, now, the context of this work is also slightly different than in the previous talks. Uh, in my case, the context is man-in-the-end attacks. And so the attack scenario here is that you have end devices, people will download software from some app store, like the Google um, uh, Play Store. They, load it, they download it on their devices to use it, and they use it to access content or uh, functionality provided by, by the software provider or services. And uh, the problem is that the software contains assets. It might contain cryptographic keys, video might be streamed through it, like via Netflix. And so companies want to protect these assets. And the problem is that people own these devices, and so they can attack them. They have full control over the software, and they can try to reverse engineer the software and tamper with the software to steal the assets uh, or to get access, to, access to, to, um, to assets, to break license checks, and so on. Yeah? Um, now, they don't do this on their smartphone because that's too cumbersome. In practice, in practice, they do it in their labs. This is a picture of a student lab from a couple of years ago. And so they're going to download the app onto a computer where they have software analysis tools to run static analysis and dynamic analysis. Then we have other, all kinds of uh, tools, like a developer board. We have uh, hardware debuggers. In a lab, we have samplers to, to collect traces from all memory accesses, for example. Uh, we have an, a scope to do power measurements. In our lab, we actually, you see here, we also use screwdrivers <laughs> to attack the software. We even have that, right? Um, so this is a different environment than just your smartphone. And in an environment like this, where the, the attackers have full control over the systems they, they deploy, yeah, with enough time, they can always break your assets. If you give them enough time, they can break it. So the goal of a protection if we want to defend against this type of attacks, it's not to prevent them completely. We just want to make it too expensive or too slow to be worth their effort. And if they realize this, they will attack the competition and not our software. That's basically our goal. Yeah? And so we're going to use um, one of the tools they use. Here you have an example is um, IDA Pro. It's a disassembler. Don't know who of you knows IDA Pro. Who of you has actually used it? Uh, so it's quite some people, okay. Uh, here you have an example um, of an unprotected program, and you see here in the corner, you see the structure of one function. It looks reasonably structured. Yeah? That means that the software is relatively easy to comprehend, to reverse engineer, maybe to tamper with it, and to steal, to get access to, ac uh, to assets, and maybe to steal them. Yeah? So we want to prevent this, and we do this with software protections. Um, this is a picture of an architecture for software protection that we developed in a project. It's way too complicated, so I don't want you to understand all of it. I just want to highlight these components here. This is the binary that you want to protect that's going to be installed on your mobile device. And if you protect it, it go, it's going to contain original code and data from the application, which you have modified to protect it. And then it, it's, it will also include all kinds of components of your protection that you linked into the program to help protect the assets in the program itself. Yeah. Problem is that for attackers, these protections, they become assets themselves because they want to circumvent, break down these, undo these protections to get access to the original secrets. Yeah. Um, and if then, if you look at the way how these programs are created with these different components, this is a picture of the tool flow we developed. Again, it's way too complex to, to explain here. But if I zoom in on one part, what you see is actually here, uh, uh, grayed out, you compile code, of course. And then you're going to link together rewritten source code that has some protections implemented in them. And you're going to link it with protection object code, object code that implements different types of protections. Okay? And you just send it to the linker, and you get a binary. That binary is still adapted. 
but components are linked in. And if you just use a standard linker, yeah, what you get is a binary that looks somewhat like this. You have different components, but all the functionality of one component is just a bunch of functions that are located right after each other in your binary, yeah, because they are linked in as one blob by the linker. And this is problematic. Yeah? There are two problems with this. First problem is that related code is grouped. So that means that if an attacker finds one routine of your anti-debugging protection, he immediately can spot the other routines in there, which eases the reverse engineering. Yeah? And the other is that each fragment that's linked in here for development ease, uh, ease and for the, the separation of concerns, every functionality in here only implements like one function in your whole protection. There's no piece of code here that supports multiple protection or that implements part of the original application and parts of a protection. And that's also problematic. And so why is this problematic? Well, identifying interesting fragments, I already mentioned that. It eases code comprehension if every piece of code has only one functionality. Yeah? That's much easier to analyze in a program. It's then easier to tamper with the protections and to overcome them. So we want to avoid this. And we developed a solution that builds on existing techniques, but combines them in a novel way and adapts them. And our solution is threefold. First, we're going to randomize the code layout, but that doesn't suffice. Then we're going to insert fake edges, control flow edges. Who of you knows what control flow edges? The control flow graph, quite some people. Uh, OK, but not all. So let me go back. Yeah. So here you have pieces of code that have been disassembled. And you have different, these are called basic blocks. Yeah? And they make up a function. And then you have these edges that show how con control can go from one block to another in the execution of your program. Yeah? And so we're going to insert fake edges to fool the tool that tries to build this, these graphical representations. And then we're going to deduplicate code fragments to fool them even more. So first, first, let's look at code layout randomization. One of the things we could try is to just mix the functions in the program. Yeah? This is trivial to do. A standard compiler and linker can do this if you, use, if you feed them an appropriate linker script and, uh, and appropriate uh, options, they do this. Yeah? Problem is that it's relatively weak. Yeah, one of the problems is that you're still going to have calls, for example, from here to here, because it's related functionality, and so it's easy for an attacker to link them back together. You can prevent this, for example, by replacing direct calls by indirect calls, but still, it's reasonably weak. So maybe we can go further. Yeah, we can try to mix individual basic blocks of individual functions and completely mix them in our binary. This is more complex, so we do randomization at the basic block level. This is more complex. Your standard linker cannot do that. But if you have a rewriting tool that rewrites your binary code, this is perfectly possible. It's still relatively weak, however. I've shown you this tool. It's called a disassembler. And it uses a technique called recursive descent disassembling. And what it does, it looks at the edges in your code that connect different blocks. And it can do so because in the code, there is at some point, there might be an instruction that says, jump to this point. Yeah? That's one of these edges. And then if the tool sees these edges, and it's going to reconstruct the functions and group the code into, into functions, yeah? it will just see that these blocks belong together and make up one function. So you don't hamper a tool like that at all with just this randomization. Yeah? You can improve this. You can try to replace some of these edges by indirect edges. Yeah? So you jump to a, po to a pointer instead of with a direct jump. If you do that, some information is missing, and then the tool cannot reassemble the code fully automatically anymore, if you do this well. Yeah? So that's an improvement. There's still a limitation, however, and the limitation is that you have reduced the amount of available information. That's fine. But you did not add any misleading information. And the problem with that is that you just slow down the attacker a little bit because he has to fill in the holes manually or with other attack tools. But he's not going to spend effort trying to like, understand code fragments that do not relate to each other at all. 
he has, he, you don't put them on the wrong foot. And to slow down attacks, it's much better to give them incorrect information rather than just incomplete information. Then they build on incorrect assumptions and they, they waste time. How can we do that? Well, we can go a little bit further. Here I have this, the whole binary again, with the edges that were still visible to the tool. I had three. We can try to fool the tool by inserting op by using opaque predicates. Who knows what an opaque predicate is? It's more or less the same people. Huh? Um, so it's a value that you know, it's an expression, and you know that it always evaluates to true or to false. When you insert code that computes the predicate, you know that because you know the code. But for an attacker, it's not obvious that it always ev evaluates to one or, or, or zero. Yeah. And then you can insert like conditional branches in your program that jump into one direction always, but this is not obvious for the attacker. And the other jump direction, the attacker has to assume that this can also be taken in the program. So you insert additional edges that can never be executed, but the defender doesn't know that. And the tool also doesn't know that. And if you do, that, if you do this, and then this recursive disassembler will try to re re uh, re rebuild functions, he will do it in the wrong way, and he will put together code fragments that don't belong together at all. Yeah? So this is much better. It's still not sufficient, however. Yeah? Many attacks are still possible. Sebastian published a survey paper about this. There's a whole bunch of techniques that can still detect uh, patterns, for example, of these opaque predicates. And with relatively simple analysis, they can be detected. Moreover, you can detect invariant behavior. If you run this program on different inputs, you will see that these edges are never f followed during a real execution. And as an attacker, you can then just simply neglect them or tell the tool to neglect them. Yeah. So we have to protect against that. Furthermore, each fragment here only, still only implements one part of the whole semantics of all your protections, which is still a, a, a limitation. Yeah. How can we overcome this? For that, we're going to use the third technique. Uh, well, actually, first, let's try to solve this one, pattern matching. It turns out, if we look back at the whole binary, that it's relatively easy to fool like pattern matches and simple analysis tools. And the idea is that we just add many more fake edges, yeah? and we couple them. We insert cycle, we create cycles of fake edges. And the idea is that if we have in, in our program, like here, we added fake edges, these edges coming out here, yeah? that, mu that means that here we perform computations that compute an opaque predicate. We can let another edge enter this bit of computations to break it up in multiple parts, and then statically you cannot prove anymore that it's an opaque predicate computation. Yeah? And so we're going to insert many of those circles. That's one of the things we do. Yeah? That breaks certain attacks. It still doesn't help us with this limitation. So we go further. Again, the original binary. I'm now going to switch to a different aspect of this binary. One of the problems here is that we added fake edges, yeah? but we still don't have any true edges in the program that can really be executed that connect parts coming from different components. If, you, if we look at some other edges, there might be edges like this left, but they only connect purple bo uh, boxes here because they only connect uh, components, uh, pieces of code from the same component, and there might be other edges that true edges, not fake ones, that connect red parts here, but they, never, they are never intertwined. Yeah. Can we do something about this? Well, suppose that this fragment and this fragment, even though they come from different components, suppose that they ha have exactly the same code. Yeah. That we might replace them with just one copy. Yeah. This is the deduplication. So we're going to do code deduplication. Uh, and if we do that, suddenly we see that there are paths to the true edges that connect red boxes with purple boxes here. And so we can fool the tools into believing that these code fragments really belong together. And it's impossible, at least with static techniques, or it's extremely hard to figure that out and to undo this. Yeah. So if we do that, a disassembler might think that all these blocks are related and belong to the same function. Yeah. If we do that, 
now the components are connected by true edges. Uh, this code implements multiple semantics. It implements part of the, the, the protection that was colored in purple and part of the protection that was colored in red. One of those might be the original application instead of a protection. Um, both of these edges can be executed. So an attacker cannot run the program multiple times and find out that only one of them can be executed and, did, and neglect the other one. Yeah? Moreover, suppose, for example, that if the, when this fragment was executed in the purple context, maybe it computed a value 3. In the red context, it computed a value 4, two constant values, which is two times simple behavior to comprehend as a human. Now, this computes either 3 or 4, which seems like a not that uh, more complex problem, but at least invariants have become variants. Yeah? And so for comprehension, this is much more difficult. So if we can do this, we can reach our goal. Yeah? Um, question is, is this easily done? It turns out, yes, this is doable. Here you see a code fragment um, in bold font. Are, I marked uh, almost identical instructions. You see load, a load, an addition, a store. A load, a load, an addition, and a store. They have different operands, but that's OK. If we rewrite them a little bit, we can make them identical. We can move out the instructions in between, and we can uh, rewrite it as this code fragment. So you see the blue, that's glue code we inserted. The red is glue code we inserted for this context. Yeah. And then we deduplicated the four instructions in the middle. Yeah. This, is very, this is very simple implementation. We have more complex ones. So this is doable. These three transformations, we combine them. Randomizing the code at the basic block level, inserting cycles of fake edges, and then this type of deduplication. Yeah. So what are the results? Well, let's first look at how often we can do this. Because I've done research for my PhD 15 years ago, where we tried to do similar things to make programs smaller, remove duplicates to make programs smaller. And then we could find some instances, but not that many. But then the goal was to make the program smaller, which means that if you have to add a lot of this glue code, you would not do the transformation. Now we can add glue code. That's no problem. Well, it has some overhead, but that's it. So here um, I show some results. Maybe just to explain, we have different types of deduplication techniques. You see them here in different bars. And we have a couple of benchmarks in this research. These three here are from the SPEC benchmark suite. They are not security sensitive, um, but they, these are benchmarks that are compiled from multiple directories. So we can consider those different components that we want to link together and it should not be visible. It should be hidden. Uh, that there were three components. This is a um, digital rights management application uh, written by an industrial partner in a research project. It's representative for real-world complexity. It has real assets. The re security requirements have been determined by uh, security experts. We deploy a whole bunch of protections to, do, uh, to protect them. And here we have something similar. This is a software license manager that also needed protection. It's from another company, but designed by real security experts, and so on. And uh, what I show here on this slide is the fraction of the instructions that can be deduplicated. And you see that this is pretty high. Eh? For some benchmarks, it's up to more than 40% that we can deduplicate, which is way higher than what we used to have for program compaction. Yeah. Now, the results I show here, all these colors, you see the legend here, it indicates from how many different components the fractured fragments came. Yeah? And then if I zoom in, like on this part, yeah, you see like this pink here, or well, here you see these top colors. Yeah? You see there are quite some fragments that come from more than 10 components even, yeah? which is really what we want. And so apparently this is feasible. And if we take a slightly different result. It's a similar graph, but here we only consider instructions that are actually executed with runs on inputs that we chose. 
because that's the code that's most uh, important for attackers. And we look not at the components from which they are deduplicated, but from the different contexts, so just different locations in the program. And that's why we have many more. Yeah? This is because then you introduce more variable behavior. It means that instead of 20 fragments with 20 invariants, we now have one version that implements all these 20 semantics and that gets executed for them at the same time. And you see like the top color here are red and uh, uh, green, and you see that they occur here uh, significantly in our results. So that's good. We can do a lot of factoring. So what is the end result? This is a very, a very different chart. What we show here is on the x-axis, uh, x -axis, we have a number of functions. And, it's, and then we have histograms here. And it shows for all the instructions in the program to how many functions do the instructions belong according to what the disassembler tool can detect. Yeah? And before the protection, Almost all instructions only belong to one function. That's normal, right? That's your standard code. There are some exceptions resulting from tail call optimization and other and, and uh, handwritten assembly and crypto libraries and so on. But the vast majority is in one function. If we do deduplication and then with the opaque predicates that link everything together in, in cycles, it turns out that uh, close to 90% of this benchmark, the instructions, supposedly are part of 2,730 different functions in the program. That's about the total number of functions in this benchmark. Yeah. And so from all the entry points of all those functions, all those instructions are reachable. It's like all those instructions have become one, become one singly connected component. Yeah. Either Pro is completely fooled by this, because either Pro can only put an instruction in one function. That's built in very deeply in the, in the data structures of IDA Pro. Binary Ninja, another popular disassembler these days, can put instructions in multiple functions. And then it can try to simplify those functions. And that's exactly what happens. It builds 2,730 uh, 2, functions, with in each of them, I think it was 14,000 instructions. Yeah? So it creates a representation where all these instructions are duplicated 2,730 times, which really slows it down and makes it a pain to use for attackers. Yeah, so we can full boat um, tools. I have some, other, some more detailed results uh, of IDA Pro. I have to look at my time. It comes fine. Um, a lot of numbers, but not all of them are very interesting. But here we just measured how many edges IDA Pro draws correctly, and how many that it should have drawn, it, it does not draw. Yeah? So we measure these, uh, the numbers you see here are uh, uh, false positive rates and false negative rates, and you see that they are pretty high. Meaning that IDA Pro misses a lot of the true edges, and it draws a lot of the fake edges. Yeah? So it fools attackers. Some other results, we split, we deduplicate code, yeah? and so where we deduplicate code fragments. You had two fragments in front, and, and prior to and after the one original fragment, and two fragments here. And we measure how many of those pairs are put together in the same function. And you see that most of them, the vast majority, is done incorrectly. The others are done correctly, which is like what you, it's just statistically you get a number like that. Yeah? Also, if you look at how many opaque predicates could be resolved, uh, with some of the heuristics that we implemented, this was pretty low. Yeah. This is not a standard IDA Pro. Everyone working with this type of protection knows that IDA Pro is not meant to be used on obfuscated binaries. But we didn't use a standard IDA Pro. We developed our own scripts and plugins on top of it to specifically counter our protection with custom attacks. Not the most complex ones, but basic versions. Yeah, and so we still get good results even if we attack things. So if you look at IDA Pro, for example, the result here, if I look at this function, now it has no structure at all, yeah? which is what we want to achieve. A final result, the overhead can be pretty high. You've seen that I've added a lot of uh, glue code. But if you look at uh, the protection versus overhead, what you see here on this axis is the number of fragments that we deduplicate, we call it factoring here, and then you see the overhead 
and percentages of uh, slowdown or code size increase. Um, but we can tweak how many fragments we deduplicate. Yeah? And we can not do it in the hottest code parts, the parts that are executed most. And you see that we can tweak performance. And for example, for this benchmark, you see the performance overhead is very high if we try to deduplicate everything. But we can bring it down to negligible overhead or even a speed up. But this is just because we were lucky with the cache behavior or so. But we can reduce it dramatically without reducing the amount of deduplication uh, without having a major impact on that. Yeah? And also the size overhead goes down. That's not that radical. Uh, that's because size it evolves linearly with the, the amount of um, deduplication. So I come to my conclusions. Um, we can hide the boundaries of integrated software protection components. I think that's important. We know that companies do certain similar things, but they have not documented it or demonstrated that it actually works. Yeah? So we combine these uh, three techniques. Uh, we can hence integrate protection components more stealthily, which we think is necessary. Yeah? Um, and the protection has a configurable potency and at least some resilience. Our custom but still relatively simple attacks at least were mitigated by our protection. That was my main message. I have one more message. Uh, we have room for hiring at least five PhD students this year. I have tons of money because of a new cybersecurity initiative in Flanders. Uh, so if you're looking for a PhD position and you're good, and Ghent is like the beer capital of the world, right? So uh, contact me. If you have questions, you're welcome. Yep. Yes, of course. This one? Ah, okay. This one. Yeah, so I see a compare against R9. Yes. assume that's a control register that's like determining where to continue the control flow. Yes. Mm -hmm. I assume you're missing a similar set on the left side. Um, well, relatively easy to look at those values to reconstruct For that zero, it is. Yeah? And with this implementation, for example, binary ninja can find out for that part that it always goes this direction. Yeah? For the other one, it doesn't. And the trick we used here is R9 is used as a base address of a store. So we know it will definitely not be zero. Because if it was zero, then the program crashed at that location. Yeah? We can also compute other invariants in the original program. And then as soon as we would put data, we would rely on data in memory. Even the most complex analysis in binary ninja give up. Because of aliasing, they cannot handle that. So indeed, you're right. You spotted that very well. Here it's too easy, eh? the way we produce this constant. But you can produce it with opaque predicates. So, and as, as soon as, so uh, wait, if I go back, so if with the opaque predicates, we let a fake edge come into this block in the middle of it, then again, it's not guaranteed anymore that it's a zero, right? So that's why we have to combine all these techniques. Other questions? More beer? Okay, thank you. <laughs>